throughout this series, I have maintained two consistent themes. One, that architecture is an idea embodied in the building. The non-physical idea and the physicality of the building constitute the essential duality of architecture. The formal cause is produced by the exercise of the mind and the other by the skills of our hands, to paraphrase Alberti. Also, one belongs to the category of speech and action, and the other is the work of Homo Faber, man the fabricator, in the scheme of an Arendt. The second theme is that the architecture is a cultural construct. Culture subsumes both technology and the programmatic demands. Now, I want to put both these propositions to test. The idea I have chosen as a vehicle for this investigation is the idea of India. The foundational narrative underlying the nationhood of India, nationhood, not nationalism, the idea of the nation. Now I know that this phrase, the idea of India has been extensively used and sometimes misused ever since Sunil Khilani first coined it in the closing years of the last century in 1997 to be exact. However, while Khilani is concerned with the economic and political history of India since partition and the role that the national ideal of democracy has played in India's evolution, I intend to focus on the cultural sphere, specifically on contemporary architecture, and explore and seek to understand how contemporary Indian architects, since the political and cultural independence in the 20th century, have dealt with the universalizing tsunami of modernism, while at the same time reconciling this modernism with the ancient and traditional knowledge system which still has much to offer. For the last several years, I have been looking for a way to analyze and understand this representative aspect of Indian architecture since independence. And I have come up with some interesting observations, which I want to share with you. Indeed, there have been several excellent studies on the works of our leading contemporary architects, both as anthologies and also in the form of monograms. This largely follow the well-established critical narrative of looking at architectural choices, either as results of historical evolution or as a response to programmatic or technological determinants. This modernist and historicist narratives, which we have inherited from the modern movement, is not adequate if we want to uncover <clears throat> ideas and ideologies which may not have been clearly articulated, but still propel the work of an architect from his subconscious. I have chosen to critically look at the work of a few selected architects whose practice immediately after independence was shaped by a new sense of nationhood inevitable for all newly decolonized nations. This is not to suggest that they consciously sought to address ideas of what India stands for in their architectural choices. No architect is, can be expected to do that. Their first responsibility rests with the profession, that is to make good architecture first and foremost. Still, having spent my childhood and youth in the initial years of the newly born nation, I'm convinced that the overwhelming sense of pride, hope, and aspirations that permeated all walks of life then must have left its traces in architecture too, just as 
We find this in literature, in theater, and in films. How was India imagined by our founding fathers? India, though one of the oldest civilizations, spreading its cultural influences around much of Southeast Asia, is paradoxically also a young nation, born as an independent democratic nation state only in 1947. This paradox of being both old and then new at the same time is of interest to our inquiry. The idea of a nation state itself is intrinsically connected with the notion of modernity. Both these notions, nation and modernity, were alien to the Indian society and emerged only as a part of the quest for political independence and self-rule. For example, there is no word in any of the Indian languages to describe nation. You cannot translate nation in any of the Indian languages. This is an enlightenment conception born out of the idea of autonomous individuals coming together to form a state, a nation democratic or otherwise. There were many who contributed to imagining what India is, what should be at the dawn of independence, notable among them those who created a unique constitution of India. However, theirs was a political imagination. In the cultural arena, I find that the work and ideas of two towering personalities of the independence movement. The poet, philosopher, artist, polymath, and Nobel laureate, Rabindranath Tagore, and Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the nation. They open up a refreshing new direction for, for us to follow. They conducted an open public debate, mainly through newspapers writing articles in the newspapers on wide ranging issues on what each imagine the modern India should be. I find that it is the divergent views on languages very relevant here. Language is an important metaphor in the debates between Tagore and Gandhi. Gandhi was opposed to the uncritical acceptance of English language and argued that true creativity of the people can be harvested only through the vernacular, as this is the language people think in. He feared that English language will make Indians emulate the West uncritically. Tagore, on the other hand, thought that the vernacular provincializes and isolates. It creates a kind of a cultural boundary beyond which people cannot communicate with each other. He envisaged India as an open and confident society, open and ready to give and receive new ideas from the rest of the world. Though I suspect neither understood the true concerns of the other behind his expressions, vernacular or English. Language only a metaphor for Gandhi. The term vernacular connoted the entire spectrum of deep rooted indigenous traditions. And for Tagore, English militated against narrow nationalism. But he was also opposed to internationalism, which presupposes the idea of nation state, a politically and arbitrarily defined geographical entity. While Gandhi as political leader was wedded to the idea of nation, Tagore as a poet was a cosmopolitan man, cosmopolitan in the sense a citizen of the entire cosmos. 
He saw the colors of the cosmos. He heard the words and the sounds of the cosmos as a one whole undivided place. But more than just a means of communication, the issue of languages conceals two much larger points which need our attention. One, contrary to the common belief, English language <clears throat> was not thrust upon the unwilling India by Thomas Macaulay, as the nationalist narrative would make us believe. Even Macaulay's famous minutes mentions that several young Indians, well versed in Sanskrit language, but unable to find gainful employment either in the local princely administration, which was being done in the vernacular languages or in the East India Company, but pleading for education in English. Besides seven reform movements, several reform movements of the 19th century had also asked for this. Hindu reformists such as Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Mahatma Jyoti Rao Phule had advocated this English language as a way to liberate Hindus from the oppressive Brahminical orthodoxy. While Sir Syed Ahmad Khan asked for the Western education in English as an instrument of social upliftment of the Muslim community. This had created a significant class of English speaking elites, well versed in the European ideas about modern science, literature, and society in general. Seen from the perspective of this new knowledge, Many of the ancient traditions, beliefs, and social behaviors appeared irrelevant to modern life and thus to be replaced by modern ways. This did have some positive outcome. Many of the age old traditions were indeed degraded and were already replaced by orthodoxies and evil practices such as child marriage, sati, and caste system, etc. This now came to be exposed by the new ideas. This is what I mean by organic modernity. When a society in natural course comes across new ideas with which outdated practices are replaced. In light of this non, so-called non-adversarial relationship with the Western culture, it was not desirable to define the new idea of India in complete opposition to all that came from the West. This is an important point. All newly decolonized societies have felt the need to define their new national identity as they emerge as independent nations. In almost all such cases, the resentment and the antagonism towards the military and the political superiority of the colonizing power provided the pretext and the context for constructing the narrative of nationalism in which the formal colonial power and all the ideas and the values it stands for gets defined as the other against whom the new idea of nation is articulated in opposition. It's a nationalism of opposition. And you'll find this many of the newly de decolonized African countries also. This process presupposes a resentful and antagonistic relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. However, in case of India, the relationship between the British ruling class and the local population has not been universally resentful. And in some cases, it was even warm. Most of the Indian elite class has benefited substantially from the English education and exposure to the Western modernity. Both Tagore and Gandhi had a much nuanced opposition to the British rule but neither imagine India as a humiliated civilization 
which needed to regain its self-respect through national assertion against a perceived adversary. After all, they both understood the benefits that the Enlightenment modernity had brought to India. While both rejected a wholesale transplantation of the Western modernity, each had a different idea of that modernity than that of the other. Thus, the narrative of nationhood that they helped construct was not a negative imagination of self in contrast to the other, the colonizing power. Theirs was a positive imagination of a nation with continuing relationship between past and present, between the old and the new, between tradition and modernity, harvested from the Indian history and its linguistic traditions. European modernity had rejected past as irrelevant to the present. Remember in the Bauhaus School of Design, teaching of history was actually prohibited. They thought that history would overwhelm the young minds and prevent them from imagining a new future. It was believed that if you're modern, you're not traditional. And if you're traditional, you're not modern. Such propositions cannot be sustained in India. Both Tagore and Gandhi differed in that emphasis, but their objective was the same. The second issue that the Tagore-Gandhi debate on languages conceal and which needs our attention is that unlike most countries where single language identifies and unifies all their citizens, India is a multilingual society <clears throat> with a two-tier structure of the knowledge system. The ancient classical language Sanskrit, whose origin dates back to the Vedic period and which is the repository of one of the most sophisticated thought systems, occupies the upper tier. The second tier consists of other provincial languages like Bengali, Marathi, Gujarati, Tamil, Hindi. There are about 22 such recognized languages which are specific to their provincial region. Most people in these regions, even without any formal education, use these for trade, artisanal work, farming, besides the regular daily domestic communication. It is in these languages that the traditional patterns of life have survived and have evolved sophisticated cultures, such as in music, we all know the innovations of Tyagraj in the Tamil language. And in literature, Gurzada Aparao stands out in the Telugu language. He was not only critical of the European representation of the local customs, but of local customs themselves. Trade was not only internal between local communities across region, but also external across seas and land with Europe, China, and Arabia via the Silk Route. With the opening of the Cape Route by the Portuguese in the 1500, and the resultant influx of goods, ideas, and people from across the various parts of the world, many parts of the coastal Indian communities had already evolved abstract cultural and social patterns such as individuality, acceptance of differences of caste, language, religion, etc., secularism and individual land rights detached from the caste considerations. These are all indices of modernism. This interesting engraving shows European ships anchored at the port of Calicut. Calicut was a major port of call. 
you can also see a building that looks like a church. European architecture has already arrived in India, we know. There is a very interesting account of it, of such intermingling of languages and of course ideas by an Englishman. And I quote, in the early 18th century, if a visitor had walked out of the East India Company's Fort St. George at Madras and proceeded southward towards the village of Agiar, five miles or so away, he or she would have heard successively English spoken at Fort, although Marathi more in its kacheri, that is office, Armenian, Gujarati, and Telugu in the neighboring black town, Urdu, Pers Persian, and Dakhni at the court of the Nawabs of Arcot. But Sanskrit mantras at the very adjacent Sri Parthasarathi temple, one of the landmarks of Sri Vaishnavism in the region, Tamil shop talks, and less exalted Sanskrit chanting at the lesser Mylapore temple, Portuguese in Santhom, and then rather more rustic Tamil in the Mudiliar villages somewhat inland from it." Unquote. Thus it cannot be doubted that in addition to the cases of organic modernity we saw earlier in Fatipur Sikri or Jaipur, through this process of diffusion with alien ideas, the coastal communities had already begun the process of modernization. One such example of diffusion is the Tirumalai Nayakar Palace, built in 1636 at Madurai, exactly at the same time when Taj Mahal was being built in Agra. It is a different kind of modernity, an eclectic fusion of Italian, Dravidian, and Rajput styles, clearly a result of exchanges of ideas not only from across India, but also from Europe. The facade has reference to the double column Renaissance facades from Italy. And the Darbar horn speaks of the inside of a borough church, not to mention the tie rods, all superimposed with Dravidian iconography. The external domes tell us about exposure to Mughal and Rajput architecture of the north, both the introduction of the Western knowledge system and the vernacular trade and commerce had brought new architectural ideas into Indian vocabulary. In the sensitive erstwhile coastal Travancore area, we find several buildings executed by local builders and craftsmen who had evolved composite language, wherein the traditional spatial elements coexisted with the European imports. The, resident, the British residency building Bhakti Villa is a residence of a wealthy merchant. And the Tanjaur Amavidu, a palace for one of the queens, all in Trivendram, were built by local builders who were comfortable embracing the neoclassical and Renaissance element from Central Europe. These are co terminus and exist side by side <clears throat> with the traditional spatial layer of the veranda and the roof from the English countryside. A Renaissance facade coexists with ease with the Rajput Jarukhas in the Queen's Palace. This indicates a versatility and freedom from the scriptural dictates that the modernist impulse entailed. No doubt hybrid and eclectic, but architecture in India was robust and motivated by a desire to do something new, transcending traditions. 
to that an extent modern indeed throughout the last four centuries. Modernity in its true sense and practice already existed in India as organic or vernacular modernity. What was brought from the West was a particular form of modernity, the enlightenment modernity. And that modernity also grew equally organically in the European soil. And we had embraced that modernity, not unwillingly. Earlier, Sanskrit was the main vehicle for knowledge for the elite class. And thus, it was the language of exclusion. The vernacular languages, on the other hand, filled the gap and allowed the excluded class, that is farmers, traders, craftsmen, artists, etc., to continue many of the traditional practices, both creative and regressive, which are still alive today. They had internalized those practices enough not to require the scriptural guidance, which was accessible only in Sanskrit. But that also allowed them freedom to improvise and adapt. While Sanskrit was replaced by English, the letter also remained the language of the few. And this duality of two parallel like, uh, knowledge systems has persisted even today, making it difficult to define what it means to be modern. At the same time, unanimity on what really constitutes Indianness has also been difficult to arrive at. Not only because of the multiple levels of diversity, which constitutes India, but also because of a contested sense of history. Post-independence, there is a surge of nationalism and also sense of guilt actually in some parts of elite class, which paradoxically demand purging India or Indian life of all that is foreign and return to ancient ideas, belief and patterns of social interactions. The educate, educated class is thus torn between loyalty to an imagined historical identity of ancient India, accessible only through Sanskrit on one hand, and the prevalent dominant worldview of modernity accessible through English on the other. In any case, whether it is Sanskrit or English, both are classical knowledge systems too removed from the day-to-day -day life of the ordinary people, whose vernacular knowledge system has all this while continued and has evolved. These ordinary people have been going about <clears throat> their lives with a different knowledge system. Many of the old traditions, which continue to be practiced in vernacular languages, <clears throat> have evolved organically during their centuries of interactions with people from distant shores. All vernacular activities such as trade, craft, art, and architecture have seen robust growth with past practices reinterpreted to suit the present conditions as a result of this diffusion. The Nelikuttus of Kerala the Chetinad houses of Tamil Nadu and the Havelis of Rajasthan and Gujarat, some, of, some with new technology and European motives, such as the iron brackets, European columns and arches with keystones of Indian motives, here in this Haveli in Ahmedabad, continued to be built throughout till the early 20th century. They were unmistakably Indian and at the same time modern in the sense of being contemporaneous in the time they were built. This is the process of vernacular or organic modernity as opposed to enlightenment modernity. There has always been a space 
for the vernacular knowledge system to grow and remain contemporaneous and thus modern. But as we just saw above, vernacular or organic modernity is not peculiar only to India. What we know today as enlightenment modernity is also a culmination of just such a process. But the difference between the organic modernity of Europe and that of India is and remains the persistence in India of the duality of the knowledge system underpinned by the two tier structure of knowledge. This requires us to reflect on tradition and modernity, not as antinomy, but as complementary concepts and interrogate our architectural heritage as I have done here to see how architects in the past have negotiated this relationship between the past and the present. In other words, to secularize the history of Indian architecture, to see the past not through the religious fault lines of Hindu, Islamic, Buddhist, or Jain architecture, as the colonial historiography has done. Unfortunately, Structuring the narrative of Indian architecture around the religious themes has clouded our view of this robust and continuing duality of knowledge system, the classical and the vernacular, and their respective relationship between the tradition and modernity. There is another way to structure history of Indian architecture as a terrain on which past and the present tradition and modernity interact with and interrogate each other. This history is yet to be written. Seen from the perspective of this peculiar Indian trajectory and the ensuing relationship between tradition and modernity, I have found that there is there have been not one, but two different ideas of India, both based on this relationship between past and the present, but each looking at and interpreting this relationship differently and have been guiding our life for the past 70 years. Fortunately, this have not been collapsed into a singular narrative. And that's a good thing. They have remained like two parallel streams, fertilizing the soil in between. I named this the way of Tagore and the way of Gandhi. Thus, we have two powerful arguments, each in favor of a knowledge system rooted either in English or vernacular languages. One driving its creative and intellectual energy from Tagore is inclined towards accepting the Western modernity as brought in from Europe, though critically interrogating it against the local belief system and adopting it to the local conditions. But, and this is important, preserving its essential spirit of abstract universality as the foundational premises of the modern modernity project. It can be seen in this painting by Sayyid Raza. This prioritizes the present over the past, while the other stream, following the footsteps of Gandhi and taking a contrary approach, seeks to anchor the idea of India by pegging it to its traditions, including ideas and practices to make them contemporaneous through reinterpretation and therefore modern. Recently, the contemporary Indian artist, Gulam Muhammad Sheikh, has created a contemporary version of the traditional folk art form known as cowards. These are painted portable temples or shrines, small wooden boxes with multiple panels connected by hinges and which open up, unfold. In his reinterpretation, Sheikh has substantially enlarged this form so that it is no longer mobile as it used to be, 
and it requires modern technology to replicate the multifaceted flexibility of the original. It still does what the traditional cowards used to do. That is, tell stories through pictorial narration. The stories are new, populated with new characters, depict, depicting new events, with which one may relate better today than with those early mythologies. Still in one respect though, it is radically different. One is no more a spectator viewing or listening from a distance. It demands that we are bodily engaged with and enveloped by the space it creates and move around the large panel to partake in the story. We are an observer, a character of the story and the storyteller all at once. To that an extent, it engenders a new consciousness, a consciousness of time that relates itself to the past tradition in order to see itself as a result of a new transition from the old to the new. Tradition is neither negated nor an anti-tradition statement being raised. Tradition is in fact considered as a model to be restated and re-invalidated through contemporary interpretation. This approach prioritizes the past over the present. While differing in approach, both these thought streams share a commonality, a belief that India will build her own modern national identity from the launch pad of her own history and traditions and not in opposition to the West or any, anything else. Interestingly, intellectual roots of both Tagore and Gandhi lay in the Indian soil and were nurtured by the respective languages, Tagore in Bengali and Gandhi in Gujarati. However, at the subterranean level, both men contested each other's ideas from their divergent positions on tradition and modernity. As Bindu Puri has pointed out, the differences between Tagore and Gandhi were fairly substantial and came from differently negotiated relationship to and understanding of tradition and modernity. Tagore was part of the Bengali Renaissance and powerfully influenced by at least one central idea of enlightenment. This was the idea that enlightenment consists in the freedom of the individual to reason for herself. Yet, it is also true to say that Tagore could not unreflectively be assimilated to the enlightenment project of Western modernity." Unquote. Besides being a part of the above mentioned Bengali Renaissance, Tagore's another connection with international modern movement provides an interesting reference. His connection with Bauhaus. After winning the Nobel Prize for Literature, Tagore embarked on an extensive tour of Europe and America, lecturing and reading from his work. Now we do not know that during this time in 1921, if he visited Bauhaus or not, but we do know that there had been correspondence between Shantiniketan and Bauhaus about design for the upliftment of the life of the common people. In any case, he was impressed enough by Bauhaus to help organize the first international Bauhaus exhibition in Kolkata, the first outside of Europe. It may not be a coincidence that in the late 1920s, when he was in his 60s, Tagore took a painting and produced works that won him a place amongst India's foremost contemporary artists. Some of these paintings bear an uncanny resemblance to the Bauhaus style and its idea of abstraction. Thus, the notion that the modern movement in arts and architecture 
being developed in Europe and had the potentiality to lead us to a new identity of modern India had already seeped into the Indian consciousness. In the art of Bauhaus, Indian artists found a way to express anti-colonial resistance. During the decades preceding the independence, many young architects such as Habib Rahman and Achit Kanwinde chose to study and train at MIT or Harvard University, where Walter Gropius had, was the chairman of architecture. He had already emigrated from Germany to America. Their work can be characterized as belonging to one of the two thought streams of architectural representation of the idea of India, the way of Tagore. In addition to Rahman and Kanvinde, I include the work of Charles Coria and Hasmuk Patel in this category. All received their advanced training in Northeastern America, the cradle of international style. But it is worth remembering that all these four architects were also conscious of the limitations of the modernist training they received in the West. While they continue to stand on the shore of the modern movement, they also critically reinterpreted and uh, adopted the traditional practices in order to modernize them. Since early in his life, Gandhi was greatly influenced by Leo Tolstoy, Henry David Thoreau, and John Ruskin. All these three were staunch critics of the then emerging modernity, urbanization and industrialization. The trio advocated a preference for the rural life and indigenous crafts. Gandhi shared this preference, but did not reject modernity outright. So there is no specific reference to the idea of modernity in all his writings. It is fair to infer that for him a modern India was to derive its substantial energy from the ancient Indian thoughts and traditions, which are rooted in and still present in the rural India in the villages. Unlike Tagore, whose gentle leaning towards enlightenment may have been reinforced by his contact with Bauhaus, Gandhi's view on architecture seems to have been shaped by his close association with the German architect Hermann Kahnbach in South Africa and his own hands-on work as an amateur carpenter while building Tolstoy farm in his ashram in Johannesburg. But even more than this, he seems to have carried vivid memories and images of the houses he lived in as a child and as a young man before going to England. He not only remembered the environment of those houses, but also had an intuitive understanding of their spatial order and the relationship between its various elements. This understanding was to play a crucial role in two other ashrams he built in India, one near Ahmedabad and the other near Varda in central India. Both this ashram show his reinterpretation of those living traditions and his solution to make them relevant to the modern life. Gandhi's interest in architecture went beyond the spatial order and encompass the materiality and the craft of building too. He had a profound influence on the British architect Laurie Baker, who left England and came and practiced in Kerala, South India. Baker recollects, and I quote, one of the things he said that impressed me and has influenced my thinking more than anything else was that the ideal houses in the ideal village will be built of materials which are all found within five miles radius of the house. In the industrialized economy which modern India has embraced, 
this may sound unrealistic, but Laurie Baker did follow Gandhi's advice and his work resonated with the rural and the urban communities for whom he built not only houses, but also public buildings in his 40 plus years of vibrant practice. Apart from Gandhi and Laurie Baker, I place the work of Balakrishna Doshi and Anand Rajay in this category. This is a modernity that is built from ground up. Architecture that is rooted in the time and the place of its making and is still modern. All these architects have, <clears throat> while taking different approaches to represent the idea of India, have prioritized either the contemporary notion of what is modern or the ancient wisdom, craft and traditions. They have reinterpreted the traditions in light of our desire to be modern and at the same time interrogated the new ideas that are brought from outside from the perspective of the ancient wisdom and traditions which are still alive. In the next two sessions, we shall take up detailed explorations of both these thought streams. <clears throat>